podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful, as always, Mr. Bob Cook. Um, Nice of you to say so. It's it's very true, it's very true. Um, And the topic of this episode is hypnotic induction in the therapy process. This is all down to you, Bob. This is not something that I do in the therapy room that I know of. <clears throat> ah, that's the last bit. I was going to say consciously. Yes. Yeah. I have a sneaking suspicion that you're going <clears throat> to tell me that I do do it at some point. <laughs> you've got a nice, for people on the actual YouTube, you've got a very nice blue jumper on. I have. Thank you. Yeah. So... One thing I, I'd like the jumper and very good for relaxation. Blue. Yeah. So I'm not saying you have to wear a blue jumper to do hypnotic inductions or to actually uh, do hypnotherapy if you want to go that far, but it's a nice jumper and a very nice relaxing colour. Interesting. Mm. I've got no blue in my therapy room. <laughs> As you can see behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it's an interesting subject area. I mean, when I trained as a psychotherapist, I never learned about hypnotic induction. So I'm not saying it's in a psychotherapy training program. Yeah. However, I went on to learn about hypnotic, hypnotic induction when I, when I wanted to work regressively. In other words, for people who perhaps don't know the word regression, it means help people go back to a younger developmental age yeah. where the deficit needs healing or the emotional um, problems have occurred. So often by regression, you can help people go back to a younger self to do the emotional healing that's needed so they can be different today. Yeah. And does it help bypass the logical thought process? The filters, the barriers, all those defence mechanisms that we put up? Yeah, if we go into hypnotic induction, certainly. But if we just slightly go back, if I may, before that question, then I quite happily talk about that question. I just want to say the purpose why you would do hypnotic induction. For me... Why I liked it is because it helped people relax. Yeah. And help people go to a what is often called the alpha state in hypnotherapy terms, um, which is really a state of increased awareness and relaxation. So in some ways, um, that's the best way to look at this. And why would you do it, learn it? You'd learn it as a psychotherapist, mainly to help people. Well, you might do it to help them relax. I wanted to learn hypnotic induction to actually help people go back to younger developmental ages quicker. You said then increased awareness and relaxation. Yeah. I, I didn't know that those two things went together. Well, I'll read out a definition Uh, of what hypnosis, if you like, is, which I just got from Google, just before we got on. Yeah. And this says, hypnosis is a changed state of awareness and increased relaxation that allows for more focus and specific concentration. Wow. So I'll do it again. Yeah. A changed state of awareness so you go into a different state of awareness than being in an adult. Yeah. In PA terms. And an increased relaxation because you've gone to a different yeah. ego state, if you want to look at it that way, that allows for more focus and specific concentration. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. It's just 
I I did hypnosis as part of NLP training years ago, but mm. it, it never fits comfortably with me. Mm. But that's probably my stuff. Um, well, no, no, say a little bit more, but no, not it's not your stuff. I understand it because, because, um, you know, I as you know, I do a lot of traveling, and on many aspects of my traveling, uh, I was thinking only in Cyprus last year. Um, I was going to with my family. It was a family holiday, and we were going out to have a meal, and we were walking down the Mall or the tourist strip, if you want, and one of the cafes there was a, a a hypnotist or somebody doing hypnosis and that was what i call stage hypnosis yeah which has this major focus to help you know and you know it's entertainment yes yeah I'm talking about that purpose uh, i'm not even talking about when people do self-hypnosis i'm talking about when we help people relax yeah get a different state of awareness a different state of uh, specific concentration to achieve a particular goal. Yeah, it makes sense now that you're saying that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when you would, you know, the hypnotic induction or whatever <clears throat> in the title, I was thinking that you put somebody in a hypnotic state, not necessarily not, not like the stage, but for me, I know at times when I'm driving, I go into that hypnotic state. <laughs> Were you know I I can't remember every part of getting from A to B. When I was nine, eight or nine, uh, I lived in Acox Green in Birmingham, and I had a bicycle. I did the bicycle world uh, sort of. <laughs> I went stopped at Alton and had a newspaper around, but basically I bicycled from Acox Green to Knoll, which I probably is. At the age of eight, it seemed a long way, but actually probably is about five, four miles or something. At and eight, it is a long way. Quite often. I didn't know how I got from Alton. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, I don't think that's hypnosis. I think that's a form of dissociation. Yeah. The other thing that, again, it's my beliefs around you know, <laughs> hypnosis, which isn't what you're talking about. Now, we've clarified that, is that, when I was doing, you know, NLP and <clears throat> did use hypnosis, the thing that I didn't like was that the responsibility for cure was put on the therapist. Well, let's just start separating terms out, just so <laughs> for the pod. I'm glad you didn't. I'm glad you, you had an aversion to that. That's great because I, I also believe in bilateral communication between therapist and client. So and contracts, as you know, in the TA world. Um, but let's just start splitting out terms, shall we? So you've got hypnotherapists. Yeah. Hypnotherapy. Yeah. Psychotherapists that do psychotherapy. Yes. You've got counsellors that do counselling. Yes. You've got psychoanalysts that usually do psychodynamic psychotherapy. So you've got different terms. So if you looked up, if you wanted hypnotherapy and you, most common most common sort of um procedures that hypnotherapists work with are usually when people want to stop smoking yeah yeah well, there's specific things they've got a fear of flying yeah they want to desensitize themselves from some from some sort of trauma they they have panic attacks so there's usually specific things they want and i i bet my bottom dollar that Probably the top one would be about stopping smoking. Yeah. Maybe second top one would be about intrusive thoughts or panic attacks. But they're usually specific goals. Yes. And they want to, um, let's say, stop smoking. They want to stop smoking and be more relaxed, say. So, you know, hypnotherapists specialize in that, six sessions or something like that. And usually what they do is relax the person, take them to an alpha state, and then carve them through metaphors, if you like, look at what you know stops the person smoking and goes go through a desensitization techniques with them. And there's we have a specific outcome because they've gone to a different 
level of awareness, if you want to put it that way. So that's sort of hypnotherapy. Yeah. And I was just thinking of a good friend of mine who ran a, a school and training people to be hypnotherapists. I think it was about nine months or maybe a year. Um, but they they usually were around those particular areas I'm talking about. Yes, yeah. Uh, the objective is to help people get relaxed, move to a different energetic state, usually called the alpha state, and uh, where they've moved away from in TA terms, adult, uh, being an adult ego state. They go to heightened sense of awareness, heightened state of relaxation, and a place where you would sort of tap into their subconsciousness. Yes, yeah. To help them through metaphors, usually, to, to achieve the specific goal of being relaxed rather than have the addictive habit, whatever yeah. the smoking's about. So it's often a specific goal with the therapist, and usually only six to nine sessions. In fact, with smoking, it might only be two or three sessions. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, hypnotherapists do a lot more than that. Somebody might go come with a specific goal, I've said, of desensitizing trauma. And then you'll go deeper into their subconsciousness, I think. Um, but if we move into the world of psychotherapists, which is much more longer, I mean, somebody comes to see you, you might might well be with you, you know, I don't up to a year or so. Yes, yeah. But it's a very, very small number of sessions usually um i suppose that there are some hypnotherapists that are usually psychotherapy trained as well which might look at longer term trauma and that is that's you know that's different they often be psychotherapy trained as well i think um and then you get counseling training and you get nlp like you've just mentioned and different things like that but you might use aspects not counseling but certainly nlp might use aspects of what I would call hypnotic induction. Yeah. And hypnotic induction is a technique that takes people into a different state of awareness and relaxation so that it supports the regression quicker. Yes. Yeah. Now, somebody who listens to this might say, well, that's hypnosis. Well, I'm talking about the the transactions that lead to a hypnotic state, which is what I call hypnotic induction. Yes. Good. I just think that needed clarifying for me, if nothing else. <laughs> which bit? The, the, the difference between hypnotherapy or hypnotizing somebody and the hypnotic induction used within psychotherapy. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if you've been trained to, in, to be a hypnotherapist, you by definition learn transactions that lead up to hypnotic induction that leads to full blown hypnotic states, if you like. Yeah. In hypnotherapy, that process or that procedure, the aim is to, as I say, to relax people, get a different state of awareness in the energetic process, leading to more specific concentration, focus. Um, and then usually through metaphor, take them down to a different place where they can um, start to be desensitized, if you like. Yeah. Now, if we get back to what you said right at the beginning, which is an interesting one, by the way, which is what you didn't like in NLP was the, um, well, you didn't say it this way, but I'm going to say that the contract is, unilateral and not bilateral yeah that's how i feel yeah i don't know enough about hypnotherapy as a profession to know how contractual hypnotherapy is i'm assuming it it's adult to adult contractual and then after that the techniques and the procedure will be in the hands of the hypnotherapist if you like yeah yeah it's just i would imagine general consensus of opinion is that if you go to a hypnotherapist to give up smoking and you have one two three four sessions however many that is 
and you still smoke, then the the hypnotherapist isn't any good. Usually people would leave. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like they don't take responsibility for what happens. You mean the hypnotherapist doesn't? No, the, 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 the client doesn't take any responsibility. It's done to them rather than with them, if oh. that makes sense. Do, do you understand uh, what I mean? So the, yeah, yeah. the hypnotherapist is either good at the job or not if they give up smoking or they don't. Oh, so it's for you it's not relational? Yes. It's, it's more like a... Uh, yeah, it's more unilateral than bilateral. That's yeah. an interesting, a great subject for podcast we could vis- we could invite a hypnotherapist on yeah to actually um talk about that because i don't know no but that i i i think that's general consensus of opinion but that's a very dated one probably i know i've never thought about the contractual processes for hypnotherapists um so it's an interesting one to talk about especially about accountability of responsibility yeah yeah, because, well, yeah, I I just think that, what you know, if, if a client is really relaxed in a, a session, one, it's a good thing, do you know what I mean, to, to feel that amount of trust with somebody. But I think that trust needs to be built up over time with somebody that you can kind of let yourself go and be relaxed in a room with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, I mean... When I went to Google and put down what is, I forget the definition of hypnosis, I also came along a very quick plan that said um, that if these things happen, then psycho, what's the word, hypnotherapy will happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so none of their procedure into hypnotherapy. One, uh, the client needs to limit possible distractions, in other yeah. words, set the mind, uh, be calmer and not think about lots of other things or wander away. Um, two, their breathing needs to be even and calm and big, big breaths. Yeah. Secondly, there needs to be a focus. This is the client. Focus on what you want to achieve, so it's specific and achievable. Yeah. They need to, in all hypnotherapy procedures, the client needs to visualise a safe place to be. So wherever that might be. Yeah. Um, Most hypnotherapists may use metaphors um, in the search for a specific outcome. And finally, the client needs to trust the process. Yeah. Those are six interesting bullet points, are that are, I don't know whether it's, you know, a universal six points, or I'm sure it's just that person's plan, if you like. But yeah. what is interesting there is the use of metaphors. Well, I think it's lots of interesting, but most type of therapists I talk about use metaphors because of what you said right at the beginning, that the metaphors bypass the cotton, logical cognitive process. You yeah. go to a place in your brain. Yes. You mean like when you're talking about metaphors, like seeing a, a, an open door and walking through an yes. open door and, and those sort of things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, 100% out of 100% of bona fide psychotherapists would ask the client to create their own safe space. Yes. Which is, I think, is a really important part, important point in this procedure. Yeah, I can remember when I was doing my NLP <clears> training, <throat> and we had to practice on each other. And one of the the ways that they took you into that relaxed state was being at the top of a very high staircase and walking down and counting down the steps as you were going. I'm frightened of heights, so as soon as they said that. I had a visual representation of being really high up, looking down. There wasn't a cat in else chance that I was going to be relaxed at that point. <laughs> yeah, you see, I think that's not a very good 
it, it wasn't for me. <laughs> I think they should check out things <clears throat> before that, <clears throat> because what you're talking about is very common. Um, you know, uh, I can I can understand that, but I think it's a challenging one if you've got problems about heights and yeah. things. Like that. Yeah, yeah. But finding your own safe place is a common process, and metaphors is a common process. Yeah, and it help people go to a different state of awareness, a deep relaxation, where you know specific outcomes can happen. Yes, yeah, and I understand <clears throat> that you know find your own safe space because it is different for all of us, and I think that's a that's a really valid point is that we don't presume or assume what that safe space is. The client goes there themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so when I thought of this title, because I'll pass this title on to you, I was thinking about um, why it might be important for psychotherapists to think about, perhaps it, even if they learn hypnotic induction, mm. if not full-blown hypnosis, because a lot of therapists, particularly a therapist that work developmentally, will use supported regression. Yeah. So that means they will help the client identify, in our case, TA, with through script analysis, yeah. early deficits in the, or the early unmet relational needs. And in TA, through inquiry, achievement, involvement, help them go back to a younger ego state or a younger self, if you like. TA often called the child ego state and then from there help the client heal and make new re-decisions which will then get integrated in the present yes now in my career that procedure I have done thousands and thousands of times and I'm not joking when I say a thousand times many 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 times Uh, first step is a contract of course script analysis and then that whole procedure i've just told you about yeah however you do need to enable the client or the client needs to be in a relaxed place to a certain extent you know or trust if you want to put it that way certainly wouldn't need to be done later on in the psychotherapy sequence where the client has built up a rapport and trust with me However, as time went on, and I, I started to watch a therapist who uses hypnotic induction and use supported regression a lot to obtain that procedure I just talked about. And what I noticed was that the, that as he did certain things, which I'm going to talk about, certain techniques, yeah, person would relax quicker and um, I think took in the protection from the therapist quicker you know yes uh, yeah or deeply through these techniques or technique if you want to put it that way and I wouldn't say they quite went into a trance but there was a level of relaxation awareness and concentration of specific outcome and was very supported by the therapist in a protective place yeah as so some of the hypnotic induction techniques i would indicate would probably be to say to the person something like okay so let's go back to the age that we're talking about now imagine that you are at the age, I'll make one up for you. Imagine yeah. you're at the age of seven. Let's just go back there a moment and tell me what's happening for you. Let's go back in time to that important time in your life. Yeah, so what I'm doing there, and slowly, two things I'm doing there. <clears throat> one, I'm well, in TA terms, it would be using nurturing channel. So my voice is quite 
warm, if you like, and yeah. nurturing. Secondly, I lower my voice to a much more nurturing channel. Yeah. Thirdly, I talk slower. And fourthly, by definition, I'm quite repetitive. Yeah. All those things are aimed at helping the person not only relax, but go back in time with the therapist who is a supportive, protective other to a place where it might have been quite challenging, challenging for them in terms of what was happening around them. Yeah. So slowing your voice down, repetitive structure, slower, nurture, help them go down, be more specific in your instructions, help them go down, and then ask them to say what's happening, thinking, feeling, and what age they are. And then, then you might move into metaphors. I probably wouldn't so much, actually, but I could do but we could see what was going on there. But those are hypnotic inductions. It would become hypnosis. I, if, if, in fact, if I moved into metaphors, probably, <clears throat> or I, I thought in terms of trance-like trance -like states, which are yeah. um, But hypnotic induction, in terms of the way I've just talked about it, aids regression. Yeah, it's really interesting. And you, you, maybe we should have done a, a warning when we started this podcast that you might feel more relaxed just listening to your voice when you're doing that. Don't listen while you're driving or something, because it is as soon as you slow your voice down and lower the tone and do that nurturing, it is very relaxing. Yeah, and in, t in TA language, it's like nurturing parent or parent. Yeah. A child, in other words, it's an invitation yeah. for the person to drop into their younger self. Now, it's very important that a client has built up the therapist as a positive object or somebody that they trust. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I call this supported regression, because they built up a trusting relationship um you become the other that's supporting them yeah and the other one that provides a protective stance so they can just drop into this yeah yeah because for me it just feels a very intimate thing between you know hopefully, hopefully. yeah yeah hopefully, though. hopefully. Because you need to, inc it has to be intimate in the sense of protection. Yes, yeah. So for the, for the client to be able to assimilate the other as a protective other, there has to be a sense of nurturing. And if you're going to call that intimacy, hopefully positive intimacy, with the therapist as the protective other, so the, by definition, then you've almost got a re recorrective experience from the beginning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I would imagine, you know, part of that session as a whole, whether it's done while they're in that relaxed state or or after it, is to integrate whatever it is that you've done. Not just kind of do that and then come out the session and right, I'll see you next week type of thing. <laughs> No, so if, if, if there'd be a contract at the beginning. Yeah. Say the contract is about they'd like to be able to be more self-confident or they want to be assertive or they want to whatever it is. You'd find out what stops them being assertive or what's the bottom of their process about not being self you know having self-confidence so well i'm not very assertive because 
I wasn't ever allowed to grow up in my childhood. Yeah. I was always kept quite young because I was the third boy in the family and I always felt that I was the baby in the family. I didn't feel I was very assertive and I was always defined as a child. So if I ever started to say my values or belief systems, I was put down. Well, who put you down then? Well, my mother, she was just always jealous of me, I think. Oh. Uh, she defined in a certain way. Okay, so would it be important for you to perhaps just go back and tell your mother things that you couldn't tell her? Oh, I can't do that. She's too much like a dragon or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's put her in a sort of one-way mirror situation and in in a room and you've got the keys so she can't get out but she can hear you what do you think of that situation so maybe you can find your own voice in a way that was denied you all those years ago yeah and if you find it too too challenging you can always stop that's a contract for regression yes yeah for the purpose, for the yeah. purpose. So the therapist would support that process and go back. And in this case, it is a metaphor, isn't it? But do all the things I've talked about. The person finds their voice for the first time and has a sense of empowerment, which perhaps they never had in their life. And then we come back and we debrief it and look yeah. at how they feel and do they need to do other things, which they obviously will need to do other things. Uh, but then take it from there. Yeah, because to me, the way that you've just described that then, I can see that it is really, really useful around limiting beliefs and beliefs, which is all connected with our <clears throat> decisions and our life scripts and everything. So it makes sense that regression is a really good thing to do. <laughs> I think it's a very important t technique, but it's also very important that the there's a contract that they trust the therapist that they've done a lot of the contractual work and therapy before they get to that stage yeah uh, and and it's not done right in the first four or five sessions or something you know yes yes yeah where the person builds a lot of trust up in the therapist to be able to get to that stage in the first place because the therapist needs to be more powerful and in this scenario I'm talking here, the mother. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, Which I, I know we've spoken about that in, in the past, about being more potent and in the therapy room generally. So I can imagine that it's even more important in this situation. How the therapist would know that or at least maximise the chances that that would be is through script analysis and learning about how the mother in this case could be father or anyone else, but the yeah, mother yeah. has been with the client or the younger self of the client. Yeah. So you, you can get, so the therapist has a good sense of the type of a mother they're going to come across. And in this case, anyway, we've set up a sort of metaphor situation where the client's got the keys anyway and the mother can't hear. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which again is you protecting them and and taking care in a supportive way, absolutely. Yeah, and if it gets too challenging, anyway, we can stop and come back and look at what was yeah. happening. Do debriefing. In many ways, you're re rewiring, if you like, in your own logical terms, um, what happened all those years ago. You're yeah, changing fantasy. Yeah, it's a really interesting I mean, the latest <clears throat> research on the brain backs up what we're talking anyway i mean the latest research by people like shaw and various other people is that we have a, a sense of plasticity in our brain structure in yeah. other words our, 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 our mind is like um form with a sense of plasticity or plastic and that the new the neuro channels uh, and there's a lot of them which are formed that you can create other neuro pathways by what we're talking about here through fantasy and rewiring the brain 
that will sit on the new old toxic neural pathways and eventually those old to toxic neural pathways will dissipate yeah. and the new neural pathways which are created through these types of techniques become the the reality of the day yeah yeah neuroplasticity i i, I absolutely agree with that it's like you know the new thoughts and new belief pathways can be formed you know instead of falling into old behavior patterns which is what we tend to do and the more you use it you know the more stronger that pathway becomes but for people listening to this it's i know a lot of people listening to therapists um this type of aggressive work might talk about hypnotic induction or not has to be done in the therapy process in the room with the therapist, not when they're alone at home by themselves. Yeah. Because if they do that, they're repeating history. Yeah. They're repeating the trauma, actually, because they've got no other protective, supportive person to enable the difference of change to happen. Yes. Yeah. So I think learning hypnotic induction and what I simply mean by that a technique of rel relaxation if you like to let the person get to a different energetic state um, is a good way to enable regression to happen yeah in the therapeutic process yeah I think that's a really good way of putting it you know to get them into a, a, a relaxed state or you know, a technique used to put them in that relaxed state. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, for people listening again, this would all be bilaterally contracted for. Yeah. So we don't spring it on them on the second time we've seen Oh, them. no. <laughs> this is a whole contractual process from beginning to end. And hopefully therapy is that way, you know. I mean, Byrne created transaction analysis and part of the reason he created it was he came from the psychoanalytical background where the psychoanalyst was the expert yeah. and the client was the patient. And it, and if there was any contracts, they were unilateral, imposed by the so-called experts. Now Eric Byrne wanted to get to bilateral contracts, where there's an I'm okay, you're okay position. Yeah, which I 100% agree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the way, um, so we're very important. Thank you, Bob. That's been really interesting. Good. So what we're going to talk about next time is the importance for the therapist to think developmentally in the therapy process. Oh, we're sort of, le <laughs> we're sort of leading on, aren't we? You did. You mentioned that earlier on in this about working developmentally. Yeah, yeah we can. Yes, that's what we're <laughs> The, the regression is all part of a developmental process. It's good. It's as if we work this out, Bob. It's as if we know what we're doing. Thank God for that. Thank, <laughs> thank goodness for that in these conversations. Okay, so I'll speak to you in the next one. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.